presentation is being very technical. I think it's probably going to be less technical than here, but we promise to be a little more deeper than swarm. Um, okay, so. All right. So the topic we're going to present today is the crypto atomic DAO. I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with the concept of DAO or decentralized autonomous corporation. Great. Um, so I think we're specifically going to use the word crypto atomic just to be very specific that it's not necessarily just a pure decentralized application, but more it has an crypto atomic. Um, and I think it's going to be more, hopefully this discussion will be more interactive, that you know you could feel free to chime in with any questions. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of introduction of myself, I'm a founder of uh, Quantify. Uh, we specifically focus on being a crypto funding platform for decentralized applications. So we go out the world to find projects that we feel are exciting, decentralized you know, application, uh, rather than being a generic crowdfunding platform. Uh, I had a background in CS, MBA, um, and then also worked for eBay for a while. Uh, my specific personal interest is kind of the intersection between philosophy, economics, and engineering. So the latter like crypto, I think, satisfy all three different stuff. Um, all right, so let's get into the DAP stuff. Maybe a little bit of a quiz for all of you. What do you think, like looking at these list of stuff? What are Ethereum, uh, Ethereum based smart contracts, Filecoin, Gems, you know, which one do you think you think are DAPs and which are not? Anyone think uh, BitTorrent is a decentralized application? Are we giving out free gems? Yes. 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 Okay. Any different answers? Any different talks? Only the Ethereum smart contract. And not yet, because it's not ready. Yes. Well, we've got customers. Yeah, we've got some cash for you. Okay, cool. Um, so, I'll probably try to get, I think there's so many different ways, different terminologies. I would probably try to put um, my own little definition around what we think are the decentralized attributes that we're looking after and why crypto economics is a key part of that. Um, so if you look at decentralized application, I think from that term, you could consider BitTorrent really being a decentralized application itself, right? They have decentralized nodes and they talk to each other, they exchange data. Uh, the only thing is, all of these nodes tend to be a barter based economy, right? So if you give me one gigabyte of data, I'll feed you back that data. It's a barter economy. There's no um, in a currency economy in that sense. So I think the way we kind of this, um, define crypto economy gap is actually you have a currency layer. So instead of it being barter, which require a simultaneous uh, meeting of you know, needs, of the mutual needs, now you could actually have a you know, data system, a ledger system, <coughs> of course, what is what, and what. So then you can redeem it later on. So that's the kind of definition that we're going after. And that's, I think, the exciting kind of breakthrough for, for um, you know, after Bitcoin. So just use an example of file. Yeah, um, I guess, are you guys familiar with file file? Basically, it's kind of like storage a made safe in solving the file distribute file system problem. And basically, they have a coin that you know, register um, all the credits that people um, consume or provide in the storage space. Um, now, what's interesting is, let's try to put a kind of definition, a more rigid definition around what exactly is crypto kind of yeah. The way we define that is it's a crypto kind of based, it's distributed application, uh, and with support, usually from the human uh, participants, it's usually become really powerful that usually displaces a company, traditional company, or a service provider in that sense. Um, you could consider something like Napster as having a crypto economy, and it basically kills the industry, trying to kill industry uh, by doing that. Uh, there's three, I think, important characteristics of these common apps. One, first of all, it has a cold part, but it also has a human involvement. So when we say a decentralized autonomous corporation, it doesn't mean it's, it has no human part. It actually can have a human part, and usually it's an integral part of that. The second part is it has a transparent business model. And I think that's what Bitcoin really pioneers, is you know it's economic distribution, you know how it generates currency, how it works before. And the third part is usually it has some kind of communal ownership. Instead of being a private company that you know, a group of small people owns it, now you have kind of more open. Um, so that's kind of the definition I would probably put around you know, as a context for this whole discussion. Um, any questions so far? So just to make it a little more interesting, let's introduce a few more other concepts you probably heard pretty. Um, I hear some some answers around smart contracts. Right? So what exactly is the difference between a smart contract versus a DAC and versus smart corporation? Um, so let's try to look at four different dimensions. First one is dynamic membership. Uh, any of you who read the sidechain paper are probably familiar with this concept, right? They define Bitcoin as a dynamic membership-based um, you know, uh, kind of ledger system. Dynamic membership basically means it's an open-ended. Anyone can join, anyone can leave. Like any Bitcoin miners you know, can do that. Um, the second part of that is autonomous you know, decisions. 
let's actually look at you know, these four examples. The one that failed this test, if I had membership, is probably smart contract. When I say I create a smart contract, let's say we have a derivative contract, a contract of differences. Usually one end is usually decided. So if I enter a futures contract against my counterparty, uh, you know, let's see if there's a fixed supply. But unlike, let's say, a decentralized exchange in a decentralized corporation, you could have unlimited participants and unknown participants uh, at all. What does it mean, autonomous decision rules? I think it's an interesting question. I, I think it's as um, the way I kind of look at it, it's usually that the deck itself can make a decision, not necessarily without external inputs, but at least with a fixed business rule that is deterministic. So you can sort of predict with that input, you can always. Versus the counter example is you have a lot of human involvement. Let's say the nodes are completely designed in a way that everybody will vote. The primary decision power comes from human, then you probably will not consider that autonomous. Does that make sense? No, because I still don't know what autonomous means. Autonomous must mean on its own. It makes decisions on its own. But it makes yes. the rules on its own, or if humans make the rules? Well, I guess, you know, in the currency without the full AI, you obviously have to human. Okay. So okay. once it enters into production, it's supposedly to be made on its own. Okay. With external potential input of oracles and all that. Um, so yeah. So what, did you say oracle? Yeah. What's an oracle? No, I mean, they could have take external data inputs. Okay. Right. Like, you know, if this sporting bet failed this result, then yes, you distribute. But that's still deterministic, as long as the input is known. Um, so, in that case, I think, you know, smart corporation is another concept. Is what if you put a company, a traditional company, but record it on the blockchain? Uh, it's still largely run by humans, so it's really, it will fail the autonomous test. Uh, or DO, I, I think, that. Uh, the third dimension is tokenized economy. And I think that's one of the major differences that we just talked about. Is if you look at something like BitTorrents, uh, yes, it has all this economy barter base, but it doesn't really have an internal capital. It allows exchange capital between different parties. So I think that's an important dimension. And the very last one is something that I don't think we talk enough about, but I think it's very exciting, is the idea of self. Right? I think you think about it, um, the, the one key difference is our symbol of a higher well, animal is probably you know, has the self-consciousness of the aware of being itself. And so far, most of the DAO or DAC that we've seen so far doesn't really have this concept of self. Yes, it redistributes, let's say you have a derivative contract, smart contract, uh, it redistributes profits or tokens between different parties, but it doesn't have the idea of itself. It's talking to external parties. So I think this is an um, interesting area that we can look at. Um, so if you look at, you know, class distributed app, there's no self, smart contract, no self. DAO could have. Uh, so I put a yellow one there because it could happen, but it's not a necessary condition. Um, but it questions it could happen. And obviously it's more a corporation because a corporation entity, like a separate legal personality, you could have the yeah, uh, self. Uh, to, to make a more concrete example, imagine, let's say, um, you create a DAC uh, where everybody, let's say, decentralized health insurance. Um, on top of the health insurance that it pulls together all the funds together, redistributes profits to your um, payouts, you could also, let's say, reinvest 1% of its profit out of the DAO um, and into the US dollar or both markets. Right? That's something that actually retains certain capital. So it has this like, um, self-contained capital. I think that would be one example of what it possibly do. Um, instead of having a lot of So that's kind of my attempt trying to clarify some of the you know, different concepts. I have a question on the term tokenized economy. I haven't really been following what's been going on the last half year in, the, in this space, but um, I'm, I'm like an old school financial <coughs> guy, and token means, I think, something completely different as what it has come to mean right now. So when you say tokenized economy, what, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it really means something that, uh, yeah, I'm trying to struggle to find the right word, but I, I used to call it internal capital or something that is basically an instrument or a token that represents a certain economic resource that it can natively decide on blockchain, right? The word you're looking for is a security. <laughs> yes, I just... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not necessarily security on this one, right? When you create a virtual property, let's say a domain name or something, it could be you know, okay. anything. But something that it can move within the blockchain. We used to call it the... Well, old school guys in this place, we used to call it digital assets. Could be. So, but, well, I guess the digital assets are kind of, I don't know. Some well, something like, based, based, something which retains value, a classification of right. something or other. Where token means something completely different in crypto, okay. which is why I find it really weird how all of a sudden it's meant. Like, yeah. I don't know who started it and why it started to be 
Probably just was the S word. We <laughs> used token because we didn't want to say security. Yes. And we needed to use a word we wouldn't get the SEC on us. So token is our new word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I guess it's just that it's just that it works. But well, token means something that's yeah. different, which is why I just, I just don't understand. It does mean something, I think, more broader than the SEC. Token itself, the tokenized economy, it represents some value within the economy which makes it. While the security is a contract or a value that resides elsewhere and it's a promise to pay that. That, that is not what the that what is. It's not a promise. You actually hold a, a thing inside the application that can be used within the application for whatever purpose you can design for. And it is a uniform resource of sorts. So it is, it is just a, a representative of something that the application can offer. It's not, it's not something that will guarantee you any kind of return or any kind of profit or any kind of value. So, so that you can output on the blockchain is a token. Bitcoin is a token. So, okay. yeah. Well, to be real precise, I think we can classify them into two big buckets. One is internal tokens or internal representation, which is basically their own value by itself. Bitcoin is a material capital value. And the other side is like IOUs. Basically, it's maps to an external economic resource, which can be a security, can be an asset, can be a goal, whatever that is. So, uh, I think that would be that's kind of the difference that we can look at. And probably today's discussion will be specifically focused on the third category, which is the DAC and DO, and what I'm personally really excited about. Um, so uh, look at, so let's talk about what exactly can DAPs do. Um, we try to, uh, we do see quite a bit of DAP project coming in uh, last, since last year. Um, I think trying to classify them into the different buckets. The first big bucket, which you see probably the most projects and the most exciting and immediate use case, is computational services. The great thing about computational services is they're all verifiable, they're very they're commoditized, they're very easy to exchange, and they're usually internalized somewhere. And you know, you could look at broad category of storage, obviously, and then I'll just put an extra category for immutable storage given blockchain unique property. You know, you could have something like Motorway, all that stuff that is really possible for. Uh, the second you have computation, and you can talk about general, generic computation, uh, basic computation, hashing, or something very specific like you want Hadoop jobs. So you can outsource a bunch of Hadoop jobs to thousand of nodes instead of going to AWS to run that job. Uh, you could have some bandwidth, you know, some like Oracle for that Instead of someone relaying your, your traffic in order to help you get Facebook in China, uh, you can now you know, pay someone basically anonymously using the token economy to shoot them. Uh, the last category I haven't seen much, but I think it's something really interesting is, is internet things. So start imagining, you know, you have a sensor, sensor network that actually you know, collects data for you, but with certain conditions. That's collecting all the traffic data, collecting, you know, whatever, uh, your room temperature data, and all that stuff, like connecting that data. So that's a big category of computational service. Uh, the second one, I think, is research distribution. Um, so that's a very broad category. And usually, and I think that's a reason why, if you look at a 2.0 space, most of the projects tend to start with financial ones. Uh, because the thing is, they're all, all your manipulative is just capital. You're redistributing capital between different parties, right? So you look at things like insurance, um, decentralized exchange, lottery, prediction markets, lending derivatives, all very financial, but all they're doing is really manipulating and moving uh, tokens around. These tokens can be either used to an external you know, commodity, hard assets, but it also could be some internal capital token of value. It could be an Ethereum type of Ethereum, it could be Bitcoin, whatever that is. Um, and the good thing is, you know, they're enforceable, uh, they're self enforceable. Uh, then you have other types of things like digital property, which not necessarily is a specific financial assets, but it could be a domain name, it could be a copyright, whatever that is. Um, third part, I think very underdeveloped right now, is human services. And I think there's a good reason for why it's underdeveloped at this stage. It's just because it's hard to verify, um, but it's something that can be very exciting. And these, I think, go hands in hand with the development of the whole sharing economy. Like look at Airbnb, look at what Uber is doing. Uh, they can be a very interesting use case, but just a little harder to verify whether someone really, you know, drives you from San Francisco to San Francisco. Right? It's just hard, harder to verify than the internet blockchain operation. But I think it will get there. Uh, the one that I think I haven't seen any so far is large-scale collaborations. When you look at traditional company, um, it's fairly easy to decentralize or debt by a peer-to-peer -peer type of company. So if you have you're a bunch of lawyers who are mostly individual contributors, sure, you can decentralize it. And everyone is paid based on their contribution. That's relatively easy to do. But if you're trying to, let's say, decentralize Google, you know, how do you do that? How do you get 100 people to collaborate at a different level? Still decentralized. They're almost by nature, you know, kind of central. But I think that's something kind of interesting. 
how to use blockchain as a way to organize people for more complicated um, um, kind of organization, coordination problems. And that's something I think, uh, we can touch with a little bit on that, is something potentially a new management structure, something like, let's say, you know, futarchy or um, um, holacracy. Are you guys also familiar with the concept of holacracy? It's basically a very flat management structure instead of having top down CEO type management structure. Like, for example, the largest company I think did so far is Apple's, which is like 3,000 <coughs> 5,000 people company. Right? All the top, instead of having, you know, all the way from Tony Shea down to the, to the lowest level employee, now we have 400 different circles. They have different circles. Each circle would rule all their own function, and it's a rough, largely, you know, flat organization between the manager and the supervisor. So these kind of new managerial, you know, patterns, paradigm can also apply to something uh, on a decentralized organization, which is really exciting. Um, so these, I think, would be three categorizations. Um, please tell me if I'm missing anything in the big buckets here. Isn't um, that, should we call that that experiment? Because none of those services really seem like they're survived. Sir, what's that? Aren't they just experiments versus services? I, none of these things you've listed here seem to be either things that are either sustainable or have found a way to actually map either the investment of time or the experiments into something that is long lasting and sustainable. I'm probably a bit more optimistic. And maybe an example of a sustainable track. Um, well, actually, I was trying to map all these the existing ones. So if you look at computation service, you know, you have a bunch of like storage, Filecoin, DNA coin, for example, very special. Are you service. calling storage an example of a sustainable service? Uh, why is that? Why is it not sustainable? sustainable? Something that, you know, we, what do we leave here tonight? We're all going to say, great, we're going to create data services at work, we're going to build stuff. What are we going to build at work? It's just really early. I would say so it's an experiment. Yeah, could be. Okay, so that's not that Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the, the way to look at it, I, I think we're looking at a service that has the potential to be to be done. I love it. I love it. Yeah. But is there anything there that, on this list, that you look at and you say, of all that are listed, this has the best potential to survive? on anything specific. I would really look at a fundamental property or even from first principle, what makes sense to be gamified. And I think right now it seems to me at least, you know, the computational service and research distribution to the easiest human part a lot harder. Uh, we probably just need better ways to measure for human performance. Right? Is there one happen. example of these services that have done well that you say we should look at and say let's study this further when you guys need your time? Um, hmm. let me ask you another one. Yeah. If you're sitting here as a developer trying to figure out I want to do something. What's, what's the biggest market opportunity to chase that? I would say, I, I think that from computational research by itself, like it's just the you know, just storage market, right? It's like $100 plus yeah. markets below. So I think it, any one of them can be huge. Uh, but then, depending on what you look at, if you look at, let's say, market capitalization or the potential you as a developer to be compensated by, you know, or create an impact, I think definitely computational research is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you talk about resource distribution, you know, that's more of the financial side. Uh, the, the harder part, I think, with resource distribution is right now you don't have a lot of tokenized world. For example, you know, if you wanted to do a, a <coughs> derivative, you probably just don't have that many real assets yet. That's probably a little bit challenge. Um, human part is, is, is much harder. So, so the Internet of Things is pretty challenging. So. Yes. Uh, I agree. How about energy production? Also, can you give me one concrete example? I don't know. Uh, if you could probably, I mean, I don't know if this is being done, but if you could prove cryptographically that a, a solar panel, uh, maybe it's a specific brand of solar panel, but this particular solar panel uh, produced this much electricity, then you have a, essentially a proof of work based on the production of energy rather than the construction of energy. Yeah, yeah. Possible. Uh, maybe it's very possible. I think it also depends on like whether it's an economy of scale. Like in some of the economy of scale, very likely it's going to be centralized, or it makes more sense to be centralized. Uh, like in solar case, I'm, I'm not I'm not too familiar with that. Like how much of efficiency difference we're talking about in kind of power plants versus you know individuals. Well, I don't think it really matters at that point because you have a collective, right? So yes, it might be less efficient, but you have it spread out, and distributed around the world, and you're creating incentives for the entire world to participate. Possible, especially if it's existing infrastructure. Like for example, I think using the example of storage. Um, you obviously are less efficient, cost efficient in the individual personal storage market, but because it's like Airbnb, it's more wasted storage anyway. So I think you have to kind of gain on that cost that one. So maybe energy would work that like as well. I don't have that. On the previous slide, you had an um, academic and individual services. What was that stand for? Uh, IOT? Internet. Yeah, internet things. Oh, yes, yeah, so sensors. 
connected to the intersection. Girl Network, <coughs> one, I think there was one project called Now. I think that was like a autonomous girl network trying to do this network. That was interesting. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Um, so let's say you know, you're a developer and you have found something interesting that you think can make sense to be gamified. So let's look at you know, at a very high level what exactly makes, uh, what are the factors that you need to think about uh, as a as a yeah. uh, The first thing you probably start with is the service layer. What exactly the services uh, you're trying to do? And the first thing you want to decide about is who are the actors and the roles that they play. Uh, in the big one world, you have migrants, you have users. You know, in another, let's say, Lazoos, which is a decentralized group, you have people who are actually driving, a streamer, you might have monitor, uh, a couple of different roles. Uh, the second thing you want to come up with is like, what is the proof of X here? Uh, how do you prove someone actually drove here? How do you prove that healthcare insurance should be paid out? Uh, which sometimes you need articles and you know, different smart contract system, which I think is great when you have something like uh, counterparties, uh, Ethereum Club, which is probably good for that purpose. Um, and then you obviously need a mutable ledger that actually records down everything. Uh, you have room for some mutable layer. So that's probably the service layer that you have to consider as an application. Um, second layer is the economy. So you have a, you probably design your own sort of structure, and uh, you're going to have a ledger, uh, you have a reward scheme, and you should issue funding. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the economic layer, depend uh, on that a little bit. Uh, the final layer is something uh, that we're talking about is itself. Is that whether that DAC has the idea of its kind of self consciousness, which is really nice. This has a trade um, that allows for some level of self modification. Uh, for example, Bitcoin, for obviously, you just deploy new version of minor to vote uh, with modification. But there could be other ways of doing that. Um, and then you also, something that I haven't seen much is interdaps. Like, how does one, for example, store J DAC talk to, let's say, a captain DAC? a mobile sensor network, or whatever that is. Uh, so that's the other part. Uh, it could also, a DAC today could also you know, interact with it through API. Let's say a DAC want to pay for its own hosting costs in AWS. Right? They could take a transaction fee and, and put these hosting costs in back to your AWS to pay for itself. Uh, you could have different kind of interactions. So we like to take a very high level there trying to lay out you know, the, the factor that you want to consider. Uh, what consensus system you want to use, what letter you want to choose, what kind of token you kind of use. Uh, that kind of makes sense. Um, I'm going to try to expand a little bit more on the economy part. How do you so, avoid like constant local minimas or local maximas in rule enforcement where systems can't be smart enough to know that they should get the lowest price of, for example, like AWS service? And in, in essence, end up bidding against themselves or being bid against other humans or apps that see these things interacting and say, what an idiot. I mean, how do you make these things smart? That's a hard question. That's a hard question. <coughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Part, part of the answer is to make it. Question? Sorry, we, we have an answer. And part, I would say part of the answer is you don't have to make it smart. You just have to make it smarter than humans on average, right? To get an improvement. Well, what does that mean? That's pretty hard. hard. Well, humans make mistakes in these kind of things, okay. too. So, I, it's probably a research question. Do that? Huh? Yes. What do you do that today? Uh, that's probably lots of research. I understanding okay. human nature and behavior. Right. Probably if you reduce the lower error rate, get a lower error rate, then you can do that. So that's AI research. Right. Do you guys do anything in AI? Do we do that kind of thing? Until we get extra on here, guys. Yeah, so I, but I guess it's, I'm not sure that's necessarily a question that's very specific to that. I mean, that's a problem that I guess all face. So, um, yeah. Let's see. Okay, so one thing that I think is really interesting about the world, and I, I don't know what you guys are seeing in on this whole side chain, health coins, DAFs coins, like one very common complaint people talk about is why are you guys are creating so many, you know, uh, all different alt coins every time you try to create new alt coins. Uh, I think that there's, there's a good explanation. There are some random alt coins that doesn't make sense to exist. But I think there's at least one good reason why you actually want to make your own token and make them valuable. And that's argument is against uh, it's around public goods. So think about software. Um, I think software, the way we think about it, is kind of like uh, the public infrastructure, like in the 19th century, you have railway and all that power stuff. And now, you know, software is the world, so everything powered by software. And, you, and once you have that public infrastructure, you want your coal to be as reusable as possible. Now, the problem with that is public goods no one fund there. So traditionally, you have a couple of different classic models for making money out of software. You can sell products, 
for Apple do? You can sell your software, you can sell for extra service. So let's say you have a Retina model, open source, Linux is open source, but we charge for the human part. Uh, the third part is the kind of more asymmetric monetization, meaning the, the software that we gave to you benefits someone who's going to, their data is going to benefit someone else, and that someone else is going to pay you. Right? You basically have these three traditional classic models of making money. But all of them results in the directions of a minority of people controlling, trying to control a certain part of precious data or whatever software, and then you know, they have a limited control in order to continue to make money. Now, I think the crypto model, uh, especially the altcoin on, on the altcoin model, I think transformed that uh, to make a new possibility. And that, I think, is the first concept of uh, saving operation. So basically, I create a software, and I create print money in my software. And I sell you that new money that I just created by being because I'm the officer of the software. Right? The good thing about that is I don't have to limit that software. It can be open source, and I make a one-time cost. So yes, so you know, you might think that you know, makes it make six million dollar raise is unreasonable. But what is the other other option? The other option probably makes it guys has to control the software, keep some closed source, and continue selling the software to you uh, in a license or some sort of way. So I think in that sense, if you think makes it something like makes it is a public value, then probably that's a little bit better model. That's an argument. The, the, the second model is capital gain. So instead of people sitting um, on the software revenue, now you could have sitting on these coins, which potentially could appreciate because of scarcity of the tokens. It depends on, I mean, how you design it, how you <coughs> potential capital. And the final part, obviously, you have the rewards. So people, uh, that's all another problem of the classical startup, is how do we get the base user, the seed user in the world? Traditionally, you spend a lot of money on marketing. You raise money from the VCs, and you spend all this money on marketing to get all these users. Now you're basically paying your user some worthless token to begin with, and now they have an incentive to help you develop software. So I think we're talking about some interesting paradigm shifts about how does a decentralized world you know, makes money and how does that kind of solve the public use problem. Uh, so in, in that sense, I think that's I think we're a pretty strong argument you know, for having actually more tokens. Now the question is, just user wanted to have all of these storage token, base token, and all that. Does that create a horrible user experience? Uh, my personal opinion that I, I think these tokens will, over time, uh, become faded into the background. You know, the software can take care of all of the, once you have enough liquidity, you have people like Melody, who you know, specialize on, you know, the kind of liquidity exchange, you can really make them very soft, uh, very kind of in the background. You can calculate all your dollar, and there's a liquidity market that automatically trade them, um, so it doesn't matter just prior to the future. Why don't you have capital losses for the token holders who have to suffer through a sure. I mean, that's the same thing as investing in a startup. How is that so? What's that? In the token holders, yes, they have capital gains and losses. Right? Yes, based on the ability to somebody to pump up or market the value of the token. How is that the same as investing in a company? It's not the same, I would say, because a company, equity in a company, is actually a claim of the asset of the firm. Yeah. What is the claim of a token? Yes. Um, so that's. Not one explanation. I think you're obviously looking at payments as a payment scheme, payment streams. It's a very simple equation. You, know, you have the price times volume, money supply times velocity. So at you know supposedly the velocity is relatively fixed or stable, that the willingness of people wanting to hold these make safe tokens or be tokens relatively constant, then obviously you have people who have more demand for these tokens pushes the price to you. But the token is not a claim on equity of the system. It's not. It's not. And that's why it probably should not be considered a security in that sense either. Okay, that's exactly the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, but they do have potential, you know, to increase the value that we see in so many different um, app points or big points. Thanks. Very good question. Um, so is this saying basically like the market cap is equal to the, the money supply times the velocity? The market cap. I'm not sure market cap is really a good question. <laughs> Um, I didn't. But market cap, I think, is something more probably appropriate to describe, I guess. Um, I'll probably call it money base or money yeah. supply. He's got a market cap. Market cap implies that he's what we're talking about. You know, yes. okay. I guess then I'm wondering would the price times the volume just be the money supply and not, and not the price times the volume times the velocity? You're saying the money supply should be times price? Uh, I guess I don't know. I, it seems like, you know, on the other side of the equation, the velocity is in a common. Well, okay, so money supply time velocity, I guess it's more similar to the GDP concept. I guess, right? You can have any circulation that is happening in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, time 
entire Wikipedia page on this, on this equation. Hey, hey Tom, uh, is there any analysis on the benefits of uh, issuing or creating your own new token versus using an existing one like Bitcoin already? Is there been any analysis on something like that? Yeah, so uh, that's, I think it doesn't make, it, it really depends. I mean, <coughs> I think issuing our tokens give you a number of advantages, especially, I guess, for pragmatically speaking. Right now, you still have so many different competing chains and competing, you know, uh, seeing that development very fast. Sometimes it makes sense to do your own chain and your own token. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to use someone else's chain, but you create your own token such that you both benefit your early adopters, uh, developers, and the payout models. Uh, I think really case by case. But right now there's a strong, I think there's a lot of those who are doing that, primarily because, I mean, you know, none of these chains are satisfactory enough for general purpose application. Yes, I guess that's one of the strong reasons, other than, you know, monetary rewards. I see this all playing out, I mean, like five, 10, 15 years from now. You know, when this oozes out beyond the walls of this room, you know, you know the, the guy on the street, what is he thinking about? I kind of think, or does he think about it at all? Like, what's, what, what's his? I would kind of, I would kind of think that I think the regular people would should not be, you know, aware of all these complicated main savers from each other. So, 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 so what's the what's the value proposition that they would perceive? It says, oh, all of this was worthwhile. So, well, they would perceive, I think, you know, for the end user, for the true pure user, I think it would be relevant to them. But now, also, the other thing that I think that should be paradigm is you would see people able to involve, invest, or you know, support these projects early on. You have to see a wider adoption. Previously, it's probably a small part of these cities who believe in these great ideas or engines. But now you're seeing you know, people who are, let's say, passionate about the same store can also support the project in the way that they can. So it's been relevant to these people, but not necessarily relevant when you get the Kindle user adoption and the rest of the numbers probably don't really care about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's cheaper price and more product. Yeah. If, you can, if you can utilize, capitalize assets that are already just sitting there on a hard drive that isn't being used, then you can distribute, you know, you can monetize that value that's just waiting to be had versus now which is idle and puts more heat on it. It's more heat, more competition, right? You know, or you can design like you're doing more services, more dynamic services, or new humans out of equations right. to make things cheaper. Right. I think yeah. So I think that's definitely one part. The other part is, I guess, as a corporation, we used to see all these large corporations taking as a middleman, taking away all of the profits, and then now these profits are basically returned back to the end user. It has an invisible impact. Third possible impact, I think, direction is how does that impact people who work, work full time? Like, you know, traditionally you have more of a taxi driver job, and now you're talking about something like Uber. Can we see that kind of sharing economy expanding you know, beyond that just transportation? I think that's the other possibly biggest impact in how people perceive full time jobs. So you may, like, 10 years from now, you might imagine that people see actually full time jobs as an outdated concept. Most of the people have some kind of booze association with you know, one of these decks. I think that's an interesting possibility. Uh, we haven't seen that unfolded very much, but I think that's kind of a possibility to see, especially with staff. So do you see more kind of programmability to this environment that would trigger more sort of workflow deviations of what goes on? Or? Uh, I'm not sure programmability is the right, the right term. Okay. I, I think it's probably more of a different way of the middleman, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and then you have more peer-to-peer -peer kind of collaboration. I think if you take physical products too, especially if you think about the hub and spoke model versus a distributed model, uh, you can draw a much faster line between the one point of the distributed model to another. Mm -hmm. the physical delivery thing. So, for instance, FedEx, for instance, has yeah. to take the products, take it to a centralized distribution center, put it back on another truck, send it out to the, the other place. And so that's how they increase their efficiency internally. But but if I can have an app that just says, hey, there's a package down the street from me that you can deliver, and then you still want to buy it, you can pick up that package and take it directly to the final destination. Okay. Okay. And I guess what you described is actually probably more around sharing economy, which I think there's a big overlap between sharing economy and the tech world. Because sharing economy is actually decentralized in the service provider, but now you still have Uber as the evil central company that's controlling part of the product. So why don't you just decentralize the last part of the company? So that's it. Can, can you decentralize Uber? Sure. I mean, there are projects doing that. I mean, there's you come on, guys. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> what, are you invested in Uber? Yeah, he's invested. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's the answer. Yeah. We're having a valuation for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Long before you were here, markets had a structure. Long after you go, markets will still be structured. What's not so, a mark about this stuff? I'm sorry, so the question is, does technology really change the structure of our market? If it does, it does so in a very slow way. It doesn't suddenly you know, break things. Publishing is still publishing today as it was a thousand years ago, except instead of using printing presses, we're using Twitter, right? But people who control the news and control information still control publishing. When we look at these models, I have to ask you, what is the structure of the current paradigm that your technology innovation is actually changing? So we can look at that and study that. As opposed to simply speculate, we decentralize Uber. When I hear things like we decentralize Uber, I wrote about that. But the question is, how does that work? Uber has a value for a reason. And what we're talking about, how Uber makes it value, is a central matter. And the question is, can you truly decentralize that effectively and cost effectively for that matter? I think, you know, when you look at like, Uber, for example, um, I would probably use the analogy of or a Kindle publisher. Instead of you know a big you know, capital multi-layer publisher that is taking you know, profit, now you're giving back more power to the authors. Um, you know, similar to Uber's. Um, I think Uber already disrupted a big taxi company, right? You no longer need so many types of company that are taking big profits. It kind of you know um, reduces the profit in the, the middleman. But I think I mean, when you look at truly what Uber is doing, I think number one is emptying the markets. That's a big, big part of this budget, right? Which is the marketing stuff. And number two is evolving software. Now I think what you see something like Uber, is like, I guess it won't happen that fast because it takes something like Uber to a very centralized way of editing the market. And let's say you already have 500 million or 1 billion users across the globe using you know, these kind of second services. Now, does people really care am I using Uber and giving them 20% of profit out of their ride, or am I using a deck, which looks the same user experience, right? So up to a point when you actually commoditize a certain industry, I think that's when it makes the most sense for a deck to come in. Sorry, Do we have a real life example that you can point to in your chart? Real life example? Of what you just asserted. We can talk to Uber. I'm asking, is there an example? Well, I guess that's why I kind of look at computing resources. So he has an app. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I, I like your definition, and I like that, you know, that, that one of the first slides you have with the um, definition of, like, you know, the different parts that take place, you know, that you need to be to be at that. And I, I, I agree with that definition, that's pretty good. But I think in most cases that these digital applications are not going to be token-based, they're going to be more like BitTorrent, and I think if someone's going to do the Uber-like kind of thing, it would um, probably be more like that than actually be an economic kind of thing. Because I find it very, very, um, hard to imagine a world where we have um, a, I find it hard to call it token-based economy, but yeah, the token-based economy, whatever. So you think it's more water economy? Or, well, well, well the, the, thing, the thing is like, Bitcoin is one thing, because Bitcoin serves the function, and the value of what it serves is, it's kind of like self-fulfilling, you know, the value of the Bitcoin Output is, I mean, it's the value comes from within, but the minute that the value comes from outside, it's very hard for it to, for for it to be done. Because Bitcoin, it, it, Bitcoin works, and it works because it is what it is, and the value of it is purely dependent on what it is, and not on some external thing such as me driving someone from one place to another. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's where I find it very hard to, uh, like th this concept of these distributed uh, currencies or tokens or whatever, whatever you want to call them, I still think the, the distributed clearing has, has absolutely has a place. And, and using something like counterparty, I think is great, and I, I have no problem with that. But I think in most cases, there will need to be some kind of integration with, with the real world. And we, I mean, we've been through, through like, I, 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 you know, like, they, they, and, like a bunch of other people in, in the original financial crypto world, we 
started off thinking we could do everything using math, and then we realized that no, when we had all the history or you know, common law and stuff like that, and we and there's something that we developed back then called the five-party model, which is basically how you can create create something trusted using actual people together with crypto, and that is that to me is more interesting to reach out and create these broader things, like to create something competitive with Uber. I, I just can't see how you can do something like Uber, you know, with a, a transportation-based token kind of... All you need to do to make Uber or like Instacart is basically Uber serves as a function to create a market. It basically says, this is the protocol that we're going to talk to each other on. And we basically say, we, I, two people come together and they say, I need this. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, if they're both happy, the person doesn't come yeah. to the car or the person gets yeah. to the person, you know, where they need to go. Both parties say, we're happy with the service. That's, you know, yeah. that's essentially a for it. Yeah, yeah it's fundamentally, that's problem. what needs yeah. to happen yeah. for this to be. It is a distributed yeah. representation. You know, so there's, you know, you got to think about it as simple as possible. I make a market, and if two people are happy together, we should go. Well, making markets is too hard to work. Yeah. True. So, well, yeah. Like, a, like a market of like computers all talking to each other. You know, like you can do it. It's like, like, like so hard to do. Do you mean make a market with new tokens, or do you mean make a market with existing drivers and a token, say USD, like a USD coin or coin, and then apply? Yeah, I mean, I don't see a necessity inherent right now to say put a token or tokenize it. I think like the to tokens work in like uh, where you have something where you have risk. In in initial adopters have risk, and they need to, if they wish to get out of that risk, trade it. So like early, you're, you're an early adopter to either like a game, a platform, a Kickstarter, something where you can say, you know what, I have this token before, like Kickstarter right now, I'm locked in like Kickstarters are never going to see the light of day. If somebody thinks, mm, I'm willing to hedge 100 to 1 that like it's going to pan out, then I can recover value. I think that's where like tokens have their applications. But like, just to make a uber coin, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, it's, I think in almost all the cases that people are talking about, tokens there are there are human beings involved. Uh -huh. and, and that's fine and it's good. And you just need to accept that and understand what that means. So for example, when when you when you go out and issue a token, there has to be something behind it. And I'm not saying that that is a registration with a federal government agency, but there has to be something something behind it. And that that is that and that's something that people do today, not necessarily great you know, in the financial institution, but I mean we have government governance models for a reason. And we shouldn't be scared of it. And, and I think it's a big mistake to think that we can solve everything with crypto. And the crypto is an important part, but we can do way better than it's been done before. But let's not discard human beings. And markets consist of human beings. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's not be naive about what's going on here. Do we can talk about distributed technology all we want. The reason you got funded and anybody else going to get funded is because somebody wants to be at the top of the pyramid. That's the case. I don't care. So, so I, I think like, if I understand this correctly, your main concern is for services that are not internal to the system. It's much harder to verify. Uh, I think, for example, you can example of Zeus, right? So the example of Uber is supposed to be. Uh, they were trying to verify, for example, like, yes. That's actually uh, the kind of the way you solve that. Uh, I don't think that necessarily, I'm, I'm totally on, on the point that I, I think that the cert part of human services is much harder to verify. So I think, you know, right now we're way much more focused on human services, financial exchange because they're all internal to the system. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do see potential. I think that technology breakthrough might come from like internet kind of things. And like now you actually have a better sensors, but actually much easier to verify, or you have a really strong street rep reputation system mm -hmm. that kind of can reinforce that self. It could come, but it's hard to so. And to solve most of those problems, like to solve for example just, just something simple as, as verifying a GPS sensor or as you were talking about before, verifying a solar panel. That is it's a tough problem. Yeah. It, it can be done, but then you go back to the kind of thing that, that all of us script owners would like to avoid. You have to trust people, and then we start needing certification programs and stuff like that. Because you know, if we if we are putting that out publicly and 
But the point I want to make is like, I think ultimately, I totally agree that I don't see like the 20 years or 50 years from now, we're all going to be centralized. I don't think that's the way to go. We're going to have see a big, significant chunk of the economy still going to be, you know, running in probably the current way or centralized way. You have startups that are innovating so fast that it's just impossible for you to centralize. It doesn't make sense to centralize. So I think the point I want to make is you look at the product you want to offer and see are they make it kind of sense to decentralize them. For something like storage, it makes maybe, maybe make sense. For something like a Tom's Jonah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Lazus, maybe, mm -hmm. or maybe not. You don't really know. So, but I think it's really important to look at hard as a fundamental, uh, especially on <coughs> scale. Uh, okay. But once you have that incentive, I'm less worried about not solving that problem. If you look at something fundamentally, that should make sense to decentralize. I think some of all the problems will solve that. Okay, cool. Um, three discussions. Let's see. There's easy. Okay. Um, so I think we'll briefly talk about the, the token mechanisms, maybe just a little bit more on the token reward mechanisms, just two, using two examples. Uh, BitShirt, for example, how do you actually reward people who initially hold the tokens? Um, BitShirt's model is you, whenever uh, you make a transaction on a consensual exchange, uh, they would actually burn the DTSX, the tokens, and then which mathematically equivalent to give you a one kind of uh, transaction reward. Uh, who's already holding that. Uh, you also have an example like Trucecoin, which is prediction markets, right? Decentralized prediction markets. They have two types of coins. You have cash coin, you have motor coin. Uh, cash coin is a store value at your coin. And then motor coin, for example, every one of the holding of uh coin will be paid for one half of the transaction fee that anyone may have on. So there are different ways, I guess, to reward the initial token holders to kind of like, bootstrap the, the token economy issue. Um, I'll just to summarize it. So, what is exactly the difference, I think, or some part of that? What's the difference between adapting and starting, or some of the advantages? Uh, I think there's a couple of things. One, the incentive part, I think, is really important. Like, anyone that's even started knows that the initial zero to a thousand users, zero to hundreds of users, are part of And I think token gives you, gives the user, the community, some part of that incentive to get your line on that. So, they actually have an incentive. Uh, the other thing you commonly see is a token sale, right? Whenever you have the initial uh, tokens, it, that's actually a chance to get yourself in some community and validate is that a product that people actually need. Uh, and I've seen quite a bit of product that we work with, uh, actually they start with a token sale and then they go out to the VC funding. Uh, they either do kind of a hybrid model, you know, that kind of makes sense because, you know, now you have proof. Kind of a little like proof. Uh, you also see, I think, that in other managers like, you know, high growth potential, liquid market and all the other amounts. When I go out to funding, you know, I spend probably twenty or thirty thousand dollars, which is like five or ten percent of my you know total waste funding on a legal cost. Now when you put something in, in the token world, you probably have much less. I, I thought the tokens like like Ethereum have received uh, a SEC letters based based on basically raising raising money on the token sales. You know how they're received? How did they have legal legal hassle? Well, well uh, yes, I guess it's more legal than certainly other regulation how to perceive that. But in terms of what I'm talking about here is from a user standpoint. When I buy a token versus when I go to Angelus and try to invest in a startup, do I have to go through a bunch of orders and you know, sign this over here? Not from a SEC standpoint. So, um, yeah, so I, I think the key takeaways here, I guess, I think we're still in a very, very young space. So I think all of this is that we've got raised, that's kind of cool now. And part of my purpose of the presentation is really to give awareness of this new paradigm and see what kind of cool application that kind of makes sense and that we can come up with in the um, They, When they design properly, I think we have the potential to replace the traditional like, company or community offers. Uh, the second part I want to make is I think uh, designing a good app economy is as important as designing a good app. There are a lot of good app that are that just doesn't make sense not. That it doesn't reward the right behavior, it doesn't reward the right actors. So, um, cool, that's pretty much it. Any, any questions? All right, that's it. Woo!